Olaso. We went on rather late last night. We went until 10 o'clock. Uh, and of course, today was Sunday, so I presume at least most of you didn't need to work. Uh, but tomorrow morning being Monday, and I think some of you may have a long drive from here to home, I think it might be a little bit better if we end a little bit earlier tonight to make sure you get a good night's sleep. Especially if. What's that? Tomorrow's a holiday. Public holiday. Public holiday. Oh. <laughs> You're going to keep me here. <laughs> okay, then we'll play it by ear. We might go as late as 10 o'clock. But I think I'll keep the Dharma talk a little bit shorter. We want to make sure we have time for meditation. Uh, I understand that the questions, I'm speaking to p people in all three rooms, I understand that the questions that were written down yesterday have been left in a car uh, some distance away, away from here. So they've not been lost, but I won't be able to answer them tonight because uh, it's too far away, but I'll definitely get to them, uh, what, tomorrow night. Okay, so they won't be lost. And so we come back to this practice of mindfulness of breathing and I thought it was interesting, just about a week ago I was in Bangkok and we had a conference on Buddhism in the age of consumerism and one of the speakers is a woman I've gotten to know rather well. She lives in Los Angeles, in California. She has started an organization called the Inner Kids Foundation and she's drawing from the Buddhist tradition, from Theravada and also Mahayana and has very ingeniously devised meditative practices for even very young children from the age of four right on through, oh, I think right now she's working up to age 13 or 14. She's teaching them basic mindfulness practices, mindfulness of breathing, some basic samadhi, and also metta, metta bhavana, the cultivation of loving kindness. And so she gave a very nice presentation of the kind of work she's been doing, working with these young children in public schools, in private schools. And they showed, she showed video clips of some of the children reporting the effects of what, what they were experiencing as a result of engaging in these practices. And one little boy, he was only maybe eight years old, he came onto the camera and he said, when I get really mad, when I get really angry, I just go into another room and I follow, my, I just watch my breath, and then my anger goes away. So he's corroborating what the Buddha said 2,500 years ago. When he gave this analogy of the, the rain cloud out of season suddenly pouring down and instantaneously all the contamination in the air is swept to the earth and the air is sparkling clear. This is a very powerful analogy. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Time is short. But if we go to the Abhidhamma, Buddhist psychology, whether Mahayana, Theravada, makes no difference. There's a lot of common ground. And I think it's a very fascinating point that in Buddhist psychology altogether, the assertion here, based upon experience, is that the mind is not simply a continuum but as the, that is from moment to moment, our awareness, visual, auditory, mental awareness, and so forth, is arising in pulses, finite pulses of cognition. So it's an ongoing stream of just very, very brief moments, much less than a second, maybe something like two milliseconds. There's some variations of use there. But very, very short bursts of attention, of a rise of attention and then fi falling, rising attention and falling, and one of the assertions of the Abhidhamma, I think it's true for all the Abhidhamma systems, I know it's true for the, <coughs> for the Mahayana, is that in a single moment of awareness, a single moment, very, very brief, not one second or even half a second, maybe just a few milliseconds or maybe 50 milliseconds, right? In a single moment of awareness of a clustering of these pulses of the cognition, we cannot simultaneously in one single instant attend to two utterly different sense fields. So it will seem like it. Right now you may be looking at me and feeling you're hearing my, my voice and seeing me simultaneously. And obviously, on a coarse level, that's obviously true. You may also, in the, and generally, in the same second, experience your own physical, your own body, the tactile sensations, and see me and hear me. Within a second, no problem. But in maybe 25 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, the attention just goes to one, that is, this is to be a cluster of these mind moments. They go only to one sense field at a time. And so it's like a monkey. I think I get, well, it's a classic analogy from Buddhism. This monkey is going rapidly from one sense field to another. And like a motion picture, I think 35 frames per second, it blurs it together so it seems like it's all one continuum. We see everything, sing, everything smoothly. But in fact, it's staccato like the frames in a, in a motion picture, pop, 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 but it blends together. So this is actually relevant to the practice of mindfulness of breathing and how in an instant, he said, on the spot, 
this practice can quell the unwholesome states of mind, of craving, hostility, and so forth. Because when we're craving something, we're really desiring something. Let's say just something innocent like dessert. Oh, I want a second or a third dessert. And I'm seeing it. And how, oh, how good it looks. And the desire is coming out. For that stream of desire to continue to arise, I need to continue to attend to the object of desire. I can look at it, I'm thinking about it, and then as I'm feeding my desire, it arises in an ongoing flow. But as soon as my mind gets off the desire, in that instant, the desire vanishes when I'm no longer attending to the object of desire. Similarly, if I'm very angry at someone, right? I'm thinking resentful thoughts, this person spoke to me badly or cheated me or lied to me and so forth. When I'm attending to this person and this person's negative behavior that I find so disagreeable, as long as I'm thinking, ah, this person is a bad person, very selfish person, then I'm feeding the anger. As soon as I take my mind off the person, in that instant, the anger vanishes. So in this practice, as we cultivate it and develop it, in the instant that the attention is drawn to the breath, maybe here at the abdomen, maybe the full body, or as we'll do in our second session tonight, the more subtle sensations at the apertures of the nostrils, in that instant, on the spot, the craving, the hostility will subside. Not forever, but you get a break. Because you're focusing here on sensations or here at the abdomen that don't arouse craving or hostility. It's a neutral object, so it brings forth a neutral mind, and you get some relief of just being battered by craving, hostility, and all the other derivative mental afflictions. There are dozens of different methods for shamatha, but among all of them, there are some unique qualities to mindfulness of breathing. And one of these is that as you engage in the practice, especially as we'll do it in the second session, where we'll focus on the tactile sensations at the apertures of the nostrils, as you go more and more deeply into the practice, the breathing becomes softer, gentler. You don't need to breathe so much volume. The quantity of air gets less. You just don't need it, right? And so the breathing becomes shallower. As the breathing becomes softer and shallower, the sensations of the breathing, what happens? It becomes more subtle. As the, as the sensations of the breath become more subtle, and if you continue to engage with it, then the mind becomes more subtle. As the mind becomes more subtle, the prana, or the flows of energy in the body, they become more refined. They influence the breath, and the breath becomes more subtle then this is a whole feedback loop. The sensations become more subtle, the mind becomes yet more subtle. Feeds back into the prana system, influences the breath, becomes more subtle. So as long as you can continue on that track of continuing to engage, engage, engage with subtler and subtler sensations of the breath, the whole system calms down, right? Now at some point, if you just then become distracted, and maybe your mind gets caught up in some desire, some old resentment, or maybe some anxiety, and so the mind becomes coarser. The mind becoming coarser, this influences the prana in the body. That becomes then more agitated, more turbulent. The prana influences the breath, and the breath becomes coarser, because the mind is coarse, and so it's almost as if your breath comes back and said, oh, you lost me. So now I'll give you a coarser sensation, so it's easier for you to engage with me again. So there's a whole feedback loop in the sensations of the breath and the quality of awareness we're bringing to it. No other shamatha practice is like that. So it's a very friendly practice. It's a user-friendly practice you know, that engages with you. And this, I think, was alluded to when the Buddha referred in this very short quintessential instruction from the Buddha himself, just characterizing the different stages of this practice. And this, re- this was recited many, many times throughout the Pali Canon. Breathing in long, one knows, I breathe in long. Breathing out long, one knows, I breathe out long. So at the beginning, when we first sit down to practice, the mind is probably relatively turbulent. We may have been walking and maybe a little bit of panting. Oh, good, now I get to meditate. And so the breathing is probably rather coarse. We've been moving about. The, The breathing is coarse. The mind agitated, maybe a lot of emotions coming up. Oh, I'm late for my meditation. I better hurry. We run to the meditation cushion. Oh, I've arrived. And so at the beginning, the breathing is likely to be relatively long because we just need more air. More air. Okay? And then you find that you, then you settle down. 
And then you note, I'm breathing in pretty long. And then the breath goes out. Oh, that's a long breath. So you note that, but then as you attend to it, and you're attending to this neutral sensation that does not arouse strong emotions or a lot of thoughts, then the whole system settles down. Naturally, without your trying to make the breath shorter, you don't do that. Let the whole system naturally settle down. And then, the Buddha says, breathing in short, one knows I breathe in short. Breathing out short, one knows I breathe out short. So you notice, then, simply that the volume, the duration of the breath, gradually, gently becomes softer, shallower. The breath becomes shorter. You just don't need as much air. You continue training. One trains thus. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. So one can take that literally, as in the cessations throughout the entire body. But the commentary state, that's not quite what's meant here. When he speaks of the whole body, it's referring to the whole course of the breath. And so there's an ongoing, continual engagement, like a rider on a horse, which is with the horse all the way through, the, the movements of the horse, the rider is there all the, all the way along. Your mind is like the rider on the horse of the breath. And so the whole course of the out-breath, your mind is continually engaged. And then the whole course of the in-breath, mind is continually engaged, almost like a child on a swing. You're there all the way through the out, all the way through the in, all the way through the out. So you're experiencing the whole course of that. Now, speaking from a little bit of experience here, because this was the first type of Buddhist meditation I ever did in 1970. And I really immediately took to it. I thought, oh, this is immediately, so quickly, this is beneficial. You may find when you really get into this rhythm of it, of just quite continuously engaging with in-breath and then the out-breath, that it takes on kind of a silky quality, very smooth, very almost luxurious, and very soothing. So it's not that it's so, such a pleasurable feeling, but the whole process, the quality of awareness, very soft, very flowing, all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out-breath, continual engagement without forgetfulness. And that's the very nature of mindfulness, an ongoing flow without forgetfulness, without distraction. So then one finds this greater stability arising with relaxation. With relaxation, the breathing goes from long to short. With stability, then you have this uh, a continual engagement of mindfulness all the way through the whole course of in and out breath. And then finally, I shall breathe in, calming the composite of the body. I shall breathe out, calming the composite of the body. Thus one trains. And what he's saying here is that when it's, as one progresses in this practice, it's, it, again, it's unique, this practice. It is explicitly really good for the physical health. Some types of shamatha practice, especially if you try too hard, can actually set up imbalances, tightness, and so forth, can create problems in the body. This method, which the Buddha taught more than any other shamatha method through the 45 years of his teaching, this one, when practiced correctly, it's very soothing for the body. The whole nervous system gets tuned. It's almost like taking your car into the service station and getting it tuned, or getting it, you know, all fixed up, the cylinders, everything perfectly tuned. This is tuning your whole nervous system, and it's calming the mind and bringing forth these qualities of the relaxation, the stillness, and then the vigilance of attention. So it's, there's, I think, many good reasons why the Buddha taught this method more than any other method of the shamatha practices. So, I want to move on. I'm going to go beyond the notes for lecture two, uh, because I think I'd like to teach another method in two days um, that I think you may find very interesting. It's actually a very deep practice. I won't go into it, into it now. But let's look at the... Well, so Asanga was one of the great Mahayana teachers from the 4th century, maybe the 5th century. He gives a method of counting, almost the same as mine, but a little bit more counting. That is, he said, when the inhalation has come in, count one with mindfulness applied to inhalation and exhalation. When the, inhalation, when the inhalation has ceased and the exhalation has gone out, then count two, counting thus one through ten. So he's saying one, two, three, four. So a bit faster pace, one count at the end of each inhalation and exhalation. On the other hand, at the end of this presentation, he says, not everybody benefits from counting. For some people, counting the breath just becomes more of clutter. 
more like just an invasion into the practice, not very welcome, not very useful. So this is where I think it's very important for us to really experiment with our own experience. Not just ask, am I doing it right? Am I following exactly the tradition? But rather knowing what's the purpose of shamatha, to develop a greater sense of ease in body and mind, the stability of attention, the vividness of attention. So that's what it's all for. And then experiment a bit. So you may find the counting as I taught. Maybe that's very useful. I will warn you, one way to do it kind of in a sloppy fashion, which many people do, is counting one, two, you know, letting the counting drag all the way through the out breath. And so you wind up really meditating on counting rather than breathing, right? So that's not, not, not really the practice. The practice is to attend to the tactile sensations of the breath and let the counting just be staccato, very brief. Now in Europe, not much in America, but in Europe, and not much in Europe anymore, they used to have, my, or in, in Great Britain, they'd have milestones when you go out to the countryside in a country road. If you've, been, if you've traveled in England, you get a lot of these little tiny roads that wander all over the place, and you'll wonder, am I still on the right road? Right? And so they would have milestones and that is every mile, there'd be a little stone saying one, two, three, and so that you know you're on the same road that you started on, out on, right? You're, go, you're, you're going where you want to go. Well, if you just go out for, let's say, a Sunday afternoon drive just to enjoy the countryside, you're not going out on the drive to look at milestones, right? They're just marking the way, but they let you know you're still on the, on the road that you chose. But, and so they just come once in a while, and they note them, oh, good, mile five, I'm still on the road. And so in a similar fashion, this counting is like a milestone. It's just a little like that, just to let you know, ah, you're still there, you're still there, right? Very staccato at the end of inhalation, or if you like, end of inhalation and exhalation. And the idea here is instead of having a whole lot of thoughts, just babbling on one involuntary thought after another, blah, 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 all the way through, you replace a lot of thoughts with just a few. Very simple, uninteresting thoughts. One, two, three, with each breath, right? It simplifies the mind, it calms the mind. But then I would suggest you experiment. You might try this some counting at the beginning, maybe one or two cycles, one through 10. And then just experiment. Try stopping, no counting. And just see if you can just now t attend single-pointedly and continuously just on the breath, with no counting. Then if you find the mind starts wandering a lot, then try one cycle of 10. See whether that brings you back. So try counting, try counting intermittently, try counting a whole session, try with no counting, and see what works best for you. Because it's, it's, there's no one method that's the best for everyone. Okay. So the counting, and then eventually when the mind becomes very stable, then the counting is really like trainer wheels on a bicycle, right? When you're a little child, you have the train with the little wheels on the side, so you don't tip over. But then as soon as you learn how to, how to ride the bicycle, then of course you take the trainer wheels off. And so similarly, <coughs> when you no longer fall off your bicycle of the breath, you're really continuously there all the way through for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, and you're just there the whole time. You're in what in modern psychologists they call flow. You're just in a flow, an ongoing flow, of just this smooth, silky, continuous attention, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath. Then when you find you have that degree of continuity, that degree of stability, then forget the counting, because it's just interrupting the flow. Okay? So for you, you people in business, cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> okay? And that is it costs you something. It's taking away a little bit from the mindfulness of breathing to interject the counting, because the counting is not breathing. So it's an interruption, right? But maybe you get more benefit by interrupting briefly with accounting, right? Because over then the whole course of the breath, your mind is not wandering. But after a while, you'll find, oh, the cost-benefit analysis has shifted over, and now counting is more of an interruption rather than benefit. Actually, the <coughs> continuity of attention is better if I don't count. Okay? So that's to experiment for yourself. So, I mentioned before, and this is a very crucial element of this practice, the point of the practice, so I'll, I'll hammer this in, is developing the sense of ease, of looseness, relaxation in body and mind. Especially for uh, those of us living in cities with a fast pace of life and so forth, 
really don't, don't want to forget that. I've been teaching for a long time, and most of the people that I've taught, or even hear about, who practice meditation and have problems. 90%, 95% of the time, the problems they're encountering because they're trying too hard. It's really, really common. They're trying too hard, they're contracting, too much effort, too much hope, too much fear, too much expectation, and then frustration, and then getting angry, and then feeling, I'm such a loser, probably I'm the worst meditator here, right? Not useful. So first of all, relaxation, stability, vividness. Now that's the whole point of the practice, right? Then we can ask, if that's the point, if this is the yeah, the very meaning of the practice, then we say, how do you do it? What's the engine that drives it? What are the faculties of the mind that we use, use and refine, in order to achieve such relaxation, stability, and vividness? So I ask you, here in this room, what are the two faculties? Do you remember? Very important, this. What are the two faculties of mind that you are using and refining in order to achieve shamatha, to develop eventually to achieve dhyana? What are the faculties? Mindfulness is one. And the other one? Vigilance. Vigilance is one translation. One translation is vigilance. Another one I've seen full awareness. Very commonly, the translators from Pali will see, say clear comprehension, right? And so none of these are wrong. And it's simply my choice. So sometimes a translation can be wrong. None of those are wrong. My choice is introspection. Introspection. So I will say for sati, mindfulness, which is quite a standard translation, and for the, I'll give you the Sanskrit, samprajanya, samprajanya, is I will, I will call it introspection, not to refute the other translations, but this is true of, of both Theravada and Mahayana. When they speak of samprajanya or Pali sambajanya, it's almost the same, it always has a reflexive quality to it. And that is you practice introspection, and that is observing your own body, right? So that's reflexive. So if I'm attending to your body, that's not samprajanya. I can bring my mindfulness to your body. Right? Why not? Right? I can bring my mindfulness to colors, to sounds, shapes, and so forth. But samparajanya, introspection, is always reflexive. It's t attending to one's own body, one's own mind. Okay? How is your mind operating? What is your posture? Are your hands moving? What is your speech? So it's reflexive. Since it's reflexive, it's intro, specting. To spect means to look, like spectacles. Right? So it's a, a specting intro. It's a reflexive awareness, therefore I call it introspection. Okay? A vigilant, discerning, intelligent introspection. And in the Abhidhamma, it actually said that the samprajana is a derivative of panya, or prajna, of intelligence. Prajna has different meanings in different contexts, but simply as a mental factor, it's very close to intelligence. So this is an intelligent, reflexive awareness, monitoring the quality of the body, monitoring how the mind is operating. So there's sati, or mindfulness, and there's samprajanya. The Sanskrit is smrti, for sati. And so what, is, what are these two faculties? I think this will be really our primary topic for tonight, to get a very clear sense of this. Because what's happened in, in the West, in Europe and America, is as Buddhism has become popularized, sometimes it's radically simplified, which can be good, then you can read a, reach a broad audience. There's nothing wrong with that. But then sometimes in the popularization, it also loses a lot of depth and clarity and sophistication. And I think that's not so helpful. And so here, I'm going to primary sources. You'll see there's, this is not my, my opinion. This is just going back to the most authoritative sources we have. And I'm going to the Theravada tradition, but which is very compatible with the Mahayana. So what did the Buddha himself say about sati, or mindfulness? He says, and what monks is the faculty of sati? Here, monks, the noble disciple has sati, he is endowed with perfect sati, and introspection, the samprajanya. So what is this? He is one who remembers, who recollects what was done and said long before. So sati has a, a very strong connotation of recollection, as in not forgetting. So can you remember what you had for breakfast this morning? So you think, what did I have for breakfast this morning? I remember, oh yes, I was with Sinto, I had porridge, what else? I had orange juice. I had one piece of papaya. Oh, I had two eggs, which I said no, and then I said yes. <laughs> I didn't want those eggs to go to waste. Right? So that I just exercised the faculty of sati. I remember what I had for breakfast. So sati may be retrospective, going back in time. What, two or three nights ago, I gave this, this, this exercise of recalling past lives, 
right? Starting with an easy, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And then going back, 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 maybe even remembering what you had for breakfast 80 years ago, right? That's sati. That's sati. That's retrospective sati. But now when we're practicing anapana sati, mindfulness of in and out breathing, this is not remembering some breath in the past, right? This is moment to moment, right in the present moment, recalling, recollecting, sustaining an awareness of this flow of the breath in the present moment. So it's not forgetting the breath in the present moment. Not forgetting. That's what really sati is about. Not forgetting what you had for breakfast. That's retrospective memory. But not forgetting the, the, the breath in the present moment. Maintaining an ongoing flow of recollectedness, recollectedness, recollectedness. That's sati in the present moment. Now, can you imagine there's any other kind of sati? Is that it for the past and the present? Could there be any other kind of sati? How about if I say, how about for the person who is closing up the Buddhist library tonight? Don't forget, if you're the last person out, make sure you close the door and have it locked. So I presumably, somebody has to remember that. It won't be me, I'll be out here sooner. <laughs> but somebody's going to be the last person out. Somebody's going to have that responsibility. Make sure you don't leave the door open. Somebody might want to come in and steal the books or the statues. So this is called prospective memory. Remember to do something in the future. Right? That too is sati. So it can be retrospective, present-centered, and prospective. There's a practice I like teaching a lot. I've practiced it. I've taught it quite frequently. It's called dream yoga. Dream yoga, right? It's a very interesting practice. You find it in, in Tibetan Buddhism. It started in India. And as you fall asleep, you practice prospective memory. As you're falling asleep, you think, tonight I will definitely dream. From the time I fall asleep, about 90 minutes later, I'll probably enter into my first dream cycle. If I find tonight that I'm anywhere other than in my bedroom, in my bed, if I'm anywhere else, I'm going to remember this must be a dream. And then while you're dreaming, you recognize that you're dreaming, and that's called a lucid dream. So you're dreaming and you're awake at the same time. Because you know you're dreaming. Very interesting practice, right? But the major method for inducing a lucid dream, knowing that you're dreaming while you're dreaming, is this prospective memory. Remembering to do something. Remembering, if I see this, I'll know I'm dreaming. Remembering to do something. If I know I'm dreaming, I'm going to do something. That's prospective memory. Okay. I'm going to give you the same quote that I gave about three nights ago or so from Nagasena, this great Arhat who had perhaps the first East-West dialogue with a representative of Western civilization, and that was King Melinda. He said, Sati, when it arises, it calls to mind or it attends to wholesome and unwholesome tendencies. So it's very discerning. It recognizes those tendencies with faults and faultless, inferior, refined, dark, and pure, together with their counterparts, these are other mental factors arising simultaneously. Sati, when it arises, follows the courses of beneficial and unbeneficial tendencies, and it recognizes these tendencies are beneficial, these unbeneficial, these tendencies are helpful, these unhelpful. Thus, one who practices yoga rejects unbeneficial tendencies and cultivates beneficial tendencies. So it's like a person who is very, like a nutritionist, or like a person who eats very mindfully. There may be some food that is very good for one person, but another person can't digest. It may be very good for one person, another person is allergic, right? Or it may be not good for anybody. Maybe it's some fruit that's gone a bit bad, or some vegetables, maybe too dirty, it can happen, and so forth. And so the person who eats very mindfully may go, we, we had a, a lunch today with a wide variety of food in this, uh, this what, vegetarian, vegetarian restaurant. It was a wide variety. So if one is attending very closely, you might see, ah, this, my digestion is not so good if I eat this. This one makes me feel bloated. This one makes me feel quite tired. But this food I can digest very easily. So then you find, as you're putting things into your mouth, which are helpful, which are unhelpful. D nutritionally speaking, which are wholesome and which are unwholesome. And in this way, you recognize what food is good for you and what's not. Right? Now that's for the sake of your physical health. Is it not all the more important as we're in a way eating our thoughts, eating our mental